All right, I think I'm going to go ahead and get started um, and people may be filtering in, um, but that's okay. So welcome everybody to our, I don't know what number webinar this is, um, but we've been doing these Tuesday webinars and they've been quite fun. Um, so this one is hidden in plain sight. So this will be one where we talk about birds that when you go to the right habitat at the right time of year, you're likely to find these birds. Um, but to start off, I'll give you guys some technical things. Um, so we're using Zoom webinar. So if you're unfamiliar with this platform, um, we can't see you or hear you. We just see and hear each other. Um, but if you need to communicate with us, you can use the chat button. So if you move your mouse or you tap your screen, you should have three buttons. One is the chat function and that you can use if you're having any technical issues. Um, and we'll put We'll probably put links and resources in there as well. You'll also have a Q&A button. If you have any questions about the content of the webinar, please put it in that button. We'll probably wait till the end of the webinar to answer any questions. But if, you're, if you come across something that you're curious about as we're talking, feel free to go ahead and put it in there and we'll address it at the end. And you should have a raise your hand button. And what you can use that for is kind of a way to like virtually be like, I know the answer to that question. So one of our presenters might be like, hey, do any of you know this bird? And then that's a way that you can be like, I do, I know, or not raise your hand, be like, hmm, not really sure. So those are, that's pretty much the end of the technical issues. Um, and so let's get started. So that's our mission that you may have read on the right hand side there. Um, and so we're the Missouri River Bird Observatory. And we work to, we work towards multiple different things, essentially working to conserve um, birds and their habitats. So we do that by trying to provide quality habitats for birds. Feeding the flock refers to working towards sustainable agriculture, bird friendly communities, and getting people out in nature. And if you wanna learn more about what each of those eggs or topics means and our work that goes into them, you can find that information on mrbo.org, that's our website, as well as any other general information you're curious about the organization. So who's gonna be talking to you today? So my name is Paige Wittick and I'm the education coordinator with the Missouri River Bird Observatory. Um, Dana Ripper and Ethan Duke are also going to be talking to you. They are the directors and co-founders of the organization. So we're all gonna be talking to you about different birds that are hidden in plain sight. And so I just wanted to start off by showing you guys the picture of this bird, which was kind of my inspiration for coming up with this idea. So this bird pictured is a blue gray gnat catcher. And this bird often comes up in conversations I have with the public, but not many people know that it exists. Um, so it's something that I thought, even though it's quite common, because if you go out in a forest in the summertime in Missouri, you're likely to hear these guys. They're definitely around. And so it was birds like this that I thought, hmm, we should highlight these birds because for whatever reason, this guy doesn't get a lot of media attention. Um, but it's a really cool bird. And so we're each going to talk to you about different species of birds that we think are hidden in plain sight. So if you go to the right habitat at the right time, you're likely to have them on your birding list. Um, and so each of us will go through a few of them. And I will start by saying that it was very, very difficult for us to pick only a few. In fact, even earlier today, all of our lists grew a little bit. <laughs> so um, I hope you enjoy it. And I'm gonna hand it over to Dana to share our first few birds. Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, <laughs> while we were getting ready to live tonight, I was thinking to myself that there's quite a lot of folks that have been on other webinars, even last week, and I thought to myself, it seems like that was a really long time ago. So if you were here last week, if you might feel like I do, that was a really long time ago. Um, as Paige said, we did have difficulty picking the birds um, that we all wanted to do for the particular presentation. Oh, I have to control my sound for a second. One second, folks. Let's see. There we go. Okay. 
There we go. Okay. All right. Um, so yes, as I worked on this, I was finalizing it this morning and realized that I wanted to add a bird. So I actually have six birds to share with you. I feel like every time we get on one of these webinars, um, I end up saying, I'm so excited about this particular webinar. This is the coolest one. But I felt that way again today before we started. So first off, um, now that doesn't look like a really hidden bird, does it? That's a pretty bright bird. <clears throat> How many folks know this bird? If you, if you know it already, please raise your hand and Paige can be able to look at the screen and let me know. Oh, I'm actually seeing some raised hands. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing six or seven or eight, nine, they're coming in. All right. Very good. So lots of folks know this bird. Um, so this is the Baltimore Oriole. And I felt kind of mean doing what I'm about to do, but I'm going to do it anyway. That's not the bird that we're going to talk about because a lot of folks know it and it's not very hidden, but what a lot of folks don't know um, is that we have another oriole species here in Missouri that's really fairly common and it's my favorite oriole. I feel I genuinely feel bad about that um, but this is the orchard oriole so we have the male on the left and the female on the right. Just a slightly different view of the male. Um, I think what has me so fascinated with this particular species is the wonderful chestnut red rusty color of this bird. Um, I just think it's really beautiful and it's a fairly rare color in our bird species. Um, the species that I think of that have this color are the underside of a white breasted nuthatch or the wing pits of a tufted titmouse. Um, and American kestrels have a bit of that chestnut color also, but it's really not a very common color. Another really cool thing about this particular oriole species is that this is what the male looks like in its first year of life. So quite different. So basically it looks like a female orchard oriole, but it has that really cool um, black bib and throat. So my next species, and the first one that I personally thought of when Paige came up with this idea, um, was the Swainson's thrush. So it's a thrush, so it's um, related to wood thrush. It's related to American robin. Um, this is a species that you can see from this map just travels through Missouri on its very, very long migration up to the boreal forests of Canada um, and Alaska and a little bit down into the Rockies and Cascades as well. Um, so we get it here in Missouri um, on migration. It's considered a fairly shy and skulky species, particularly on its breeding grounds. Um, I haven't found it to be super shy when we see it here during migration. So um, I cannot think of seeing Swainson's thrushes on migration without a conversation by text that I once had with our friend Carol David um, of the Missouri Prairie Foundation. A lot of folks on this, on this Zoom probably know who that is. Um, so she and I were texting one morning last spring and I said, I'm so excited. I have Swainson's thrushes on my front lawn. You know, there's a little bit of singing, but they were hopping around basically like robins. And I was really, really excited about it. And she texts back, she's like, I've got the same thing here. And she lives in the town of Columbia, the city of Columbia. And so there went my fantasy of having this like magical yard that only Swainson's thrushes came to my yard. Clearly that wasn't true. Um, but it really got me thinking about how very common this particular species is um, and how we don't tend to notice them as much as things like the American Robin. So I'm going to play for you now. Oh, nope, I'm not. I'm going to give you an expanded map. Sorry about that. Um, I did want to point out that this thrush is a, a very long distance migrant. Um, they're well known for getting fat. Um, they store up a lot of fat reserves before their migratory flights and they will ascend to several thousand feet in the air and they can fly two to three hundred miles a night, which I always thought was quite remarkable.
So like many thrush species, it has that beautiful flute-like ethereal song that makes them wonderful to listen to. Um, a couple of things that I found quite interesting about this species, um, they have a relatively short breeding season, as you saw earlier with that map, they're up in the fairly far north, um, and they have a relatively protracted spring migration, which is pretty unusual. Um, a lot of our bird species are hustling to get to their breeding grounds. They want to get there, they want to establish territories, they want to kind of control resources, um, get their um, territorial disputes out of the way and get on with the nesting season. But this bird has been recorded in decent numbers um, still in the southern United States in early June at times. So very different from a lot of our migrants, even though they can really get up there and cover a lot of ground, three to two to three hundred miles a night if they if they would like to do so. Okay, so here's a bird that is hidden in plain sight once you arrive in the bird's habitat, which is wetlands. So have you ever gone to a wetland and heard this? This is a bird called a Sora, and I did add this picture because even when you do find them, and they're really very numerous in Missouri um, during migration, uh, they can still be actually a little hard to see. You might be hearing that whinny that I played and then the per weep call as well. You might be hearing that all around you, but if you get a good look at one of these, um, these rails, it's a, it's a pretty good treat. So they are the most, um, most abundant and widespread of any of the North American rails. So you can see here that they too, um, there, there are a few breeding records in Missouri, but largely they migrate through Missouri. Um, I've heard a lot of stories from bird watchers and we've experienced this ourselves um, up at Grand Pass Conservation Area here in Saline County, that if you go to a wetland where they are and you get out of the car and you slam your car door, they will sometimes respond to that. They're a very, very responsive species in terms of vocalizations. Sticking kind of with the wetland habitat, um, this is the common yellow throat, little masked bandit. Um, so this bird also, um, is an inhabitant of wetlands, um, also breeds in wet areas of prairies as well. Um, very shrubby areas, like thickets. Um, I think even though you can see it's a very strikingly colored bird, it's quite small. Um, and that may be one of the reasons that it's typically overlooked that and it prefers to be in dense thickets. Sometimes they'll pop out though and you can, you can see them sing. So we have the male on the left and the female on the right. Just a little bit different view here. Um, so you can see that this is a species that breeds throughout the state of Missouri. It was one of the first birds in North America described by science. Um, in 1766, a specimen was sent back to Europe and actually named by Linnaeus himself, which I thought was kind of interesting. Um, the species is apparently, even though we can't always see them um, or find their nests, um, they're heavily parasitized by brown-headed cowbirds, which lay their eggs in other species' nests. Common yew is one of the few species in North America that has really um, ad adapted a good response to this. And what they'll do is if they find their eggs disturbed by a brown-headed cowbird or a brown-headed cowbird egg in the nest, they will often build a second nest on top of that and start again. There are even records of them building a third nest on top of that and starting again. Now we will go to the prairie. Um, and for folks in our, our rural areas of Missouri, um, I'm about to introduce a species that is quite ubiquitous. Um, we have certainly seen them singing on the sides of things like fescue fields, um, a little bit around corn fields. Um, they are certainly a prairie obligate species. They are not a forest species in any way. Um, we've seen them in wetlands that um, 
aren't holding water. So basically during the breeding season when our, our river and stream levels tend to go down um, and our wetlands get a little drier, they will start colonizing those areas as well. So that might be a familiar, familiar song to folks. And this bird is actually named after its song. It is the Dick Sissel. So this is another quite long distance migrant. Um, you can see that in Missouri, its core breeding area is certainly our prairies in Northern and Western Missouri. And if you look down towards the bottom, towards their wintering areas in South America, you can see that this map from Birds of the World designates um, their non-breeding areas and then where they're scarce. And what the dick thistle tends to do is in the wintering season in South America, it will form very, very, very dense flocks. Um, so this is a species uh, I just thought I'd mention that is a big part of MRBO's uh, prairie bird nesting project. So our technicians, I asked um, our field crew leader, Eric, this morning, I said, about how many dick thistle nests have you all found over the course of the study? And they've found about 280 dick thistle nests. So you can see one there at the top, and then you can see some cute little fledglings down there at the bottom. I did want to point out that in coloration, the dick thistle is somewhat similar to the eastern meadowlark. And I think the eastern meadowlark is, is probably more familiar to folks. Um, it's just I feel like it's sort of like a well-known bird for anyone that has grown up or lived in um, the prairie states, the plain states. Um, but you can see their coloration is fairly similar, particularly on the breast and belly and throat, right? But this is a case of convergent evolution. They're not very closely related birds. Um, the eastern meadowlark is a blackbird and the dick thistle is a cardinalid, so it's related to our, our cardinals. I'm going to ask for a show of hands. Who knows what this little guy is? I've got three or four. Four, page says four. Five, six. So this is a very cryptic species, very easy to overlook. Um, if you see something on the side of the trunk of a tree that looks like a moving piece of bark, you are not losing it. That is probably this bird. This is a brown creeper. Um, very small insectivorous bird that kind of moves kind of jerkily along tree trunks. I'm gonna ask Paige to show a video here in a second um, so that you get an idea of what this bird looks like. Um, down here uh, in Missouri in the winter time. And this particular bird will, has, this, has this behavioral habit of flying to a tree, kind of spiraling up the tree and eating and then flying back down to the, to the bottom of the next tree and then spiraling up in their fashion and then flying down to the next tree. And that's sort of their foraging movement. They also, when they're here in the winter time, they are well known for joining what we call mixed foraging flocks. So they will um, go along with a whole troop of birds, including chickadees, titmice, um, downy woodpeckers, sometimes um, yellow rump warblers are in those. Um, so it's really fun when you're walking in the woods and you hear a number of different vocalizations of different species and you say, oh, I bet a mixed foraging flock is coming. And then here they come and um, several different species will be represented and it's kind of neat to see that. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I, I'm asking Paige to do this because her internet is far better than mine. And so when I tried to play the video, it didn't work very well. So hopefully it'll work, everyone can see. All right, everybody, just let me make sure I get.
So I hope everybody could see that. I could see it and I don't have the greatest internet on the planet right now. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Ethan. He's just simply gonna come and join me here um, at my computer screen again, internet. So Ethan. I think that your sound should still be on. Great. Hi, everybody. I've been watching in the background. Um, yeah, I would like to talk about the the hidden plain sight birds that uh, a few of them that I dearly love and uh, share my screen here. Make sure the sound is right. Yep. It's good. I was checked. Yep. Good. Very good. Um, anybody know what this bird is? <laughs> Just kidding. Um, this this bird is often hidden in plain sight, and it likes thick vegetation, so it's not often seen, even though it's often at lower levels. Um, occasionally, they'll get up on trees and and and. Uh, make some noise, but um, they're often just on the ground scratching around using their bill to move things around. It's the brown thrasher. And I hope you love these pictures by Tom Tucker. Um, I've used them for other presentations as well, but I actually threw more in this one just because they're also good. Um, this bird really gives itself away by its song. Um, it was in Ripley's Believe It or Not. He sings over 2,000 different songs, and they sing a lot, and they often just invent their own songs. Uh, you can distinguish it from other birds that sort of sing similarly. It really stands out not only because it sings a lot, but it's often just in phrases of two. So here's a sound spectrogram and an audio of the brown thrasher singing just a little bit. Very inventive bird, that is. Um, here's just some more uh, gratuitous uh, Tom Tucker photos of the baby birds in his backyard or the, uh, the brown thrasher feeding the, um, uh, its babies. Um, how cute is that? My goodness, little fluff balls. Yep. Really sweet. That's a lot of babies to take care of too. Look at that. So these could be in your backyard as well, in suburbia, or out in the country. Uh, the next bird I'd like to talk about is a bird that um, is often in thick cover as well, like the brown thrasher. Um, in fact, so much so that its sound is probably more studied than the actual bird itself because it's really tough to study its behavior because it's, unless it's perched out there, singing and doing stuff, we often don't get a chance to see it. But it's this bird. How many people know this bird? Let's see if we can raise a hand. There's a few, there's a few. If, now this bird might help you with its ID because they do sing often and they do sing well and it's very distinctive. So I'm gonna play its, its song here. Pretty much universally that's accepted as saying drink your tea drink your tea and that bird is the eastern towhee so they're they're quite prevalent uh, throughout all of eastern and, and what in the central US all the way north um, and they vary a little bit throughout the range this is here is a picture of one in Florida notice how it's, it looks a little differently than the other ones it has that white eye Here's another photo by Chrissy and, and uh, Andy that's um, of a towhee in Missouri. But look at that, something a little different about it there. And also it, 
it does sound a little differently. I think it's saying drink, drink tea, drink, drink tea. This is the spotted towhee, noted by those spots on its back. Very similar, but the, the eastern towhee doesn't have those. And they're often here in Missouri in the wintertime. Um, so a good thing to keep an eye out for. Um, another special common bird, which I absolutely love. How many of you know this bird? This one can be a little bit tricky too. Ooh, ooh, wow. Yeah, wow, look at it, more people know this one. It's, oh yeah. So this, this little beauty here has a really nice sound as well. And that just sounds very almost canary-like or almost finch-like. And so this one happens to be the house finch. Not to be confused with this one, which is a nice photo by uh, Paul McKenzie. This is the purple finch. And we'll get into a little bit how that bird's different here. Here they are in a pairs. This is one of the cutest things about these birds. I swear, they're almost always in pairs. They just show up together right at the feeder. Um, they're, just, they're just super, super tight <laughs> couples. Um, so this female here, which, looks pretty brown and drab. We did a whole section on sparrows and things that were, seemed to be brown and drab, but if you look, there is a little bit of detail there that you can notice, but there's a little bit of detail that you cannot notice because it doesn't exist on this pair of house finches like it does on the purple finch. Here's the purple finches. This is a photograph taken at his feeders by the late Brad Jacobs, who is a wonderful ornithologist here in Missouri. He's the kind of guy that had so much incredible knowledge about birds and he would tell you all about them and share experiences with you and never, you would never feel like he was being condescending or talking over you. He's a really great guy, but he took this wonderful picture in his backyard and look at that white stripe. So these purple finches down below have this lighter stripe up and above their eye that helps you determine the difference between a purple finch or a house finch. So, what bird is this, everybody? If you think it's a purple finch, raise your hands. <laughs> if you think it's a house finch, raise your hands. A few more of that. Well, people are leaning towards house finch. Nice Tom Tucker photo there in the red buds. House finch, yeah. So house finch or purple finch, there's another one. I'll tell you what, this is often, even the good bird nerds, if you don't get a good look or even if it's not the right angle, it can be really difficult sometimes. So here's a thing that might help you out. This is the range of the purple finch. And note that this is between December and February. This is the range of the purple finch in this time of year. So you're, it's more likely if you're seeing one this time of year, it's more likely to be a house finch. Here is the house finch's range, um, December through February, but this is its range pretty much year round. Also, you'll know it's pretty interesting that there's a population way out there in Hawaii. And some, some have been seen up there, uh, up, up towards Alaska even. Um, so I hope that helps you clear things up a little bit with this. Um, and then this is the last uh, bird that I'll cover. And you might know it already just from its blurry silhouette. But if you don't, you might know it's from its vocalization. there. I think I might 
Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We got some hands raised and people know this bird. What a beautiful photo by Mark Gutchin too. You can really see some of the subtle beauty in this, in this bird. So this bird is related to pigeons as well. Um, it, it's, uh, it's a, they're pretty unique. It is the morning dove. Um, they're kind of ubiquitous, but they're often um, hidden in plain sight. And especially their nests. Their nests are just, I'm sorry, they're just not that great. Like this one is probably like a flattened out old cardinal nest or something that just happened to be like, well, I'll just throw a couple sticks up here and make a nest. I've seen them way worse than this even. And so if you're walking by, you can walk right by them sometimes and not even notice them because they're just a couple sticks with an egg on top. Um, but yeah, these are often hidden in plain sight. I, I don't blame them. I don't think they ever get super, super intelligent. They have a very short life expectancy. Like your average morning dove only lives about a year or so anyways. But they're, they're pretty good parents. Um, another unique feature about them is that they... Uh, uh, produce crop milk, which all all the uh, birds in their family do. Pigeons, I think I heard even some flamingos do. But in this in this family, they all produce crop milk, and it's theorized that they can't produce enough of it to take care of very many young. So doves and pigeons usually only have about two eggs in their nest. But they're pretty good parents, and both of them produce that crop milk uh, for the first few days of the the nestling's life. Look at that range. They're pretty much everywhere. They even popped up over in Europe in places. So, and then also out in Hawaii. So yeah, um, the only other thing I would like to say about them, if you are lucky to see these birds, right? Uh, hidden, hidden in plain sight. Um, the male and females can be really difficult to distinguish. And what they say is the adult male is slightly more colorful than the female and uh, the, the pale rosy breast is, versus the tannish one in the female. Um, so they're a little bit more color, and oftentimes it requires really good lighting to be able to see that. So don't feel bad if you're not able to determine that, but it's interesting to look for because the colors that make that happen are so subtly beautiful. Here's a good close-up of, of a male morning dove, and you can really see this color, this, this bluish on his crown and everything, and he's already, he's obviously puffing up. <laughs> he says, hey, ladies, check me out, you know, kind of thing. And and looks like he's, he might be actually uh, going to coo a little bit there. But that, those are the birds that I had to share, and we'll hand it back off to Paige. All right, thanks, Ethan. Oh, birds are so cool, aren't they, guys? <laughs> um, so let me just make sure I get going here. All right, so I told you I would talk more about this guy, and I am. <laughs> so this is the blue gray gnat catcher. And despite its name, Gnats aren't actually like a huge part of their diet, um, but I think it's just has to do with the small nature of this bird and it does eat insects. Um, but like Ethan and Dana pointed out, this bird is much more likely to be seen instead of heard. Um, and in Missouri, you're gonna find it, if you look at that range map, you're gonna find it during the summertime or the breeding season, and you're gonna find it in more forested habitats. And they're difficult to see because they're quite small um, and they hang out in leafy trees kind of near the top. <laughs> um, so you're unlikely to see them. And they also move around a lot. So even if you do get your eyes on one, it's difficult to get it in your binoculars because they like to move about. But sometimes when you're, they're moving, you'll see this white edge to their tail. Their tail is a little bit longer than their body and you can kind of see these white edges to their tail flying about. Um, but you're much more likely to hear them. And so this is what they sound like. So 
that first like buzziness is what I hear most often. Um, but what's interesting about their songs too is they'll mix in snippets of other bird vocalizations into their song as well, which I think is very interesting, but also might make it a little bit difficult to identify, but that can be part of the fun. Um, another fun fact that I wanna share about these guys and why they often come up in talking with the public is because of their nests. So their nests look a lot like hummingbird nests, but they're a little bit bigger and a little bit deeper. But both hummingbird nests and gnat catcher nests are made out of spider silk and lichen, which is that flaky stuff that you see on trees and rocks and different things like that. And they line that with their nest, one, to camouflage it, kind of like in this picture here. And also it kind of gives their nest structure and kind of acts like shingles. But what's really cool, I think, is and takes a lot of work is that they can build up to seven nests in a breeding season. And I don't, I don't want to like give a average number of how many like all birds make because some birds do make more than one and a lot of them make more than one and it's hard to know exactly how many, um, but that's a, seven is a high number. Um, and they'll reuse materials from each of those nests and that can be really beneficial for them for their nesting success um, to help prevent against things like predation, um, nest parasitism, like with the brown-hatted cowbird that Dana talked about with the common yellow throat, and they often can get infested with mites. And so by creating a new nest, you kind of buffer against some of those issues. So really good nest builders. Hmm. Um, oh, and I guess the last thing I'd like to share with that slide is a lot of these fun facts that I'm sharing with you guys are from allaboutbirds.org. Um, which is also where that video that we showed you um, from the brown creeper, um, that's also on that website. So if you're looking for interesting things about different species that you're seeing, um, that's a really great website to check out. So the next bird I'm going to talk about is the eastern wood peewee. So this bird is a flycatcher, um, a type of flycatcher, which, which are notorious for being difficult to identify. Um, but this is one of the most common ones that if you go out in a forest in Missouri that you'll hear. Um, not to be confused with another one that will sometimes nest in people's porches and houses, which is the Eastern Phoebe. And the main way to tell the difference is one by the sounds that they make. The Phoebe is named, they're both named after their call. So the Phoebe kind of goes Phoebe, 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 Phoebe. And I don't have a recording of that, but you may have heard that around. It's kind of buzzy. Um, and also a great way is the Phoebe um, does the tail wagging motion. So if you look at the, the camera, if this is the Phoebe's body, their tail kind of goes like this and they bob it around. And so if you see a species that isn't bobbing their tail um, and has these white wing bars on the sides of their wings, it could be an Eastern wood peewee. <laughs> And it, and it lacks an eye ring, a white eye ring around its eye. Those are good indications that you're looking at a wood peewee. Another great way, obviously, and I'm going to show you guys another cute picture of a wood peewee that's a little bit poofed up, <laughs> um, but that's what they look like from the front. Um, but another great way is to listen to their call. So it kind of, and like I said, they're named after their call and their habitat. So this is what that sounds like. So next time you're in the forest, listen for that POE <laughs> uh, call. So this is kind of that habitat picture, another look at that bird. And like you can see here, they're here during the summertime. So that'll be the best time to look for them. And one thing that I want to share about fly catchers in general that I think is really cool is they're kind of like insect ninjas. So a behavior that you'll often see and is very common with the wood peewee is they'll sit on a branch fly out, catch an insect midair, and return to that branch. And I'm just thinking about the eyesight that you must have to be able to see an insect in the air, like a small one, 
and catch it midair has got to be really cool. <laughs> So I think this is an amazing bird that's often, that you'll often hear. So the next bird is not just one bird, but a group of birds that I wanted to mention. So when I say the, term, the word vireo, a lot of people look at me like, what are you talking about? They don't even know that this whole group of birds exists. And that's because they don't get a lot of attention for whatever reason. Um, but they're really, really cool. And they're characterized by their beak shape. Um, so if we take a look at this picture, a little bit more zoomed in, their upper mandible is a little bit longer than their lower mandible, and they have this kind of hook at the end. And they're, so they kind of look almost like a warbler beak, but a little bit thicker. Um, they have a little bit more of a curvish, well, they, look, they look thicker and they've got this little hook at the end. And they're also quite small, like a warbler, and they kind of hang out in similar parts of the forest that a warbler does, um, but they're slightly larger, um, and they have like a little bit of a more elongated shape to them. And they're also typically gray, yellow, or light tan in color. Now, I'm going to go over some specific species that are more common here in Missouri. Um, but I'll go over, I'll, I'll kind of briefly show you all the types of vireos that we can get here in Missouri um, more commonly. And, but I'll focus on the ones that you're most likely to hear, really. Um, so the first one is the warbling vireo. So this one, um, I'd say nine times out of 10, I hear it more than I see it. Um, it's very plain looking, very, when the, this picture shows a little bit of yellow, but when you see it, out in the forest, it's more just kind of like white and then gray on top um, and very pale overall. Um, but it does not have a drab song. So this is what this guy sounds like. <laughs> Um, when I was learning this guy's or this bird's song, I was told it's like the mnemonic device was I will see you and I will squeeze you until you squirt. <laughs> so it's kind of like da 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 <laughs> and uh, that abrupt um, note at the end. And so um, I think that's a really cool one to hear. They sound really neat. Um, the next one that I would say is very common is the red eyed vireo. So I showed you, I picked this picture because you can really see the red eye of this red-eyed vireo. It does in fact have a red eye, um, but that's very difficult to see um, in the field. What you're really looking for to distinguish the red-eyed vireo is this olive back, white belly, and more specifically this white line above the eye, this white eye line. And of course, the vireo beak. Um, but like all vireos and like a lot of the birds we're talking about today, you're much more likely to hear it. And I think it kind of sounds like a slow robin call and you can kind of think of it as having three parts to it. So here's what that sounds like. So you may have heard that when you've been walking out in the forest before and not even knowing what it was. <laughs> and that's the red-eyed vireo. Um, so next, I'm gonna focus a little bit more on this guy, which is called the white-eyed vireo, very obviously also because it has a white eye. <laughs> um, and I think this is one of my favorite vireos. It's got a lot of, when you see it, it just seems like it has a lot of personality to it. Um, and like all of these birds, you're more likely to hear it. I think its sounds are really, really cool. Um, so this is what this guy sounds like. <laughs> White-eyed vireo.
sounded a little bit like a gnat catcher, but the that first phrase that it did or the first like section of that recording that chick, 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 is the one that um i find really enjoyable and that i know that that white-eyed vireo is in that bush whether or not i see it i can hear it and it's right there um but another really cool fun fact about these guys and this was on allaboutbirds.org that i didn't know about until i was looking researching into this bird which is that they'll, they've been observed bathing by rubbing their body against dewy foliage in the morning. <laughs> so I guess they're taking advantage of that water on the trees much more than the rest of us. <laughs> and another really cool thing is that in Florida, scientists found a 400,000 year old wing bone from a white-eyed vireo from the late Pleistocene era. And it is the is North America's only fossil record for the whole vireo family. So out of all the vireos, it is the white-eyed vireo's wing bone that was discovered from 400,000 years ago. Pretty interesting to me. All right, now this bird we have to mention because Dana mentioned the nest monitoring project um, before when she was talking about um, the dick sisal. And this is another one that we monitor for that project called the Bell's Vireo. And I think this one fits the theme pretty well, which is if you go out to a prairie or a grassland, you're likely to see this bird. Um, but you're really unlikely to see it. You might see it like on a forest edge, but you're unlikely to see it other places. <laughs> and during the summer, that's an important part too. Um, so this guy is much more plain looking. So it kind of looks like that warbling Vireo. Um, but it's in a different habitat. So that's how you know what you're looking at. And I also wanted to show you some pictures that the staff took when they're looking out at their nests because baby birds are both ugly and cute at the same time. <laughs> um, but this is what their nests look like. Um, and to give you more perspective, if you look at, um, and maybe I can stop my share real quick so you can see my screen, but so this is what their nests look like. So they can tend to have like on branches and then they'll weave around the stick or sometimes a piece of grass to kind of secure their nest in there and it's made out of straw. And then they put their little eggs in there and that kind of gives you an idea of how big they are, which is not very big <laughs> um, and how big those eggs might be. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again to show you guys the last species of warblers <laughs> that are a little, bit less common. So the yellow-throated vireo is another bird that breeds here in the summer, but it's slightly less common than those other ones. Um, and then the blue-headed vireo and the Philadelphia vireo are two vireos that migrate through here in the spring and fall, and you might see them. Blue-headed vireo, slightly more common than the Philadelphia vireo. <laughs> Um, and a little bit more easy, more easily ad identifiable too, because it's got that dark vireo head and the spectacles. <laughs> Whereas the Philadelphia vireo, lo vireo looks a lot like the warbling vireo. <laughs> so yeah, so that's all the vireos. So if you didn't know they existed, hopefully you definitely do now. Um, and you'll be able to see them out in the forests of Missouri during the summertime and maybe even during the spring and fall. So that's all I have for you guys. Um, and now we'll open it up to question and answer. Um, and awesome. So it really looks like we got about eight minutes till 630. Um, but if you guys have a lot of questions, we'll stick, stick around past them. But if you guys have to go, that's fine too. Um, so if you have any questions, go ahead and stick them in that Q&A button. So if you tap or move your mouse, you should see that bar and there's a Q&A box. Go ahead and put your questions in there. If you have any questions about any of the birds we talked about, or if you have any questions about a bird that has been appearing around your house all the time and you're like, what is that? <laughs> um, or anything like that, um, you can go ahead and put it in there. I see a hand raised. So if anybody, if you, if you have your hand raised and have a question, please do throw it there in the Q&A, type it in there. We have the Q&As down at the bottom of your screen there. Bottom or top, depending on what kind of device you're on. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> 
we freaked everybody out. Yeah. We freaked <laughs> everybody out. <laughs> I, I could do a whole presentation on Vireos, you guys. <laughs> Information overload. <laughs> These are all the cryptic birds. <laughs> are there other doves besides the morning? Oh, yeah. Uh oh. Here we go. <laughs> Look out, everybody. Look at them all. Look at them all. There's a lot of good doves out there. Um, but you're likely to see probably Eurasian collared dove, but usually that's around towns, grain elevators, stuff like that. It's a bunch bigger. It's got a big broad tail and it doesn't sound as nice. They're not native to North America. There was concern that they would displace some of our morning doves, but I don't think that's found to be true in most areas. Um, but they're, they're big. They're a little lot bigger, a little duller looking. Um, we've had white winged doves in Missouri. I think we've had, um, was it little ground dove? Um, Inca. Incas. Inca doves have been, these are rarely seen. Vagrants. Yeah, real, real vagrants. So it's not going to be something you'll commonly see. Um, spotted doves, white tip doves. There's quite a few different ones. Of course, they're in that larger family too of, uh, morning doves are in one one uh, genera, but there's many genera of pigeons and doves in that family Kluber day. And here's a picture of the Eurasian collared dove. I can throw it right up there. See how it's great, lighter colored and all that. So um, those are the ones you're likely to see. <clears throat> yeah, awesome. The There's a pair of, and if you're looking to see the Eurasian collared dove, there's a pair that hangs out at the feeders here at the office almost all the time. And they, the, and when you see the difference between the morning dove and the collar dove, the collar dove is a lot bigger. Well, not, I shouldn't say a lot because in my reference of birds, it seems a lot bigger. <laughs> and then it's much whiter. It stands out so much more. It's not nearly as camouflaged to its surroundings. <laughs> um, so I think we answered that. <laughs> I just wanted to add that. So do we consider the house finch invasive? So I'll let Ethan answer that since he covered that bird. <laughs> oh, uh, the uh, house finch is native. Um, in fact, the house sparrow, what you'd often see it at um, the gas station or a box store is the, um, the European um, house sparrow, which had, has historically had an impact on um, many birds, but primarily on house finches through spreading conjunctivitis and being mm. in close proximity. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's another, not as invasive as the house sparrow, but still an exotic that lives in St. Louis, which is the uh, Eurasian house sparrow. And um, people actually go out of their way to go out to see those little buggers. Um, but, uh, yeah, so the, the house finches and purple finches, completely native. So <clears throat> I'll add that I believe that though house finches are in fact native to the United States, to North America, I believe that they were previously a Western species and that they, and I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure of the story, but I don't know if they were introduced purposefully or by mistake, and it wasn't that long ago. I believe it was like the 50s. I mean, I'd have to look up the exact details, but in the East, and then they basically took over the continent. They weren't, I don't think they were always here. So, I mean, in that way, yes, they might be considered invasive, um, but they're not a non-native invasive species like the ones that Ethan just mentioned. And uh, the house finches, I haven't heard of them that they're not a cavity nester, so they don't compete with the, our other cavity nesters or do them harm like the house sparrow does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So possibly the most important question of the evening, uh, what type of bird ate Ethan's hat? Don't people pay for this? I think people usually pay for this type of, type of thing. That'd be the Great White Pyrenees bird. Yeah, the Great White Pyrenees bird, yes. <laughs> when they're about a year old. That's a nibble. <laughs> and then Amy asks, is it too late to see the Orioles? No, um, both species are still around. 
Um, they both breed here. And actually, Amy, you bring up a good point. I didn't show a map of Orchard Oriole. Um, Orchard is more of a, historically, it was a savanna species. So it's going to be in um, oak savannas. So very, very open woodland type habitat, um, of which there is not much in Missouri. Now, that being said, um, <clears throat> park-like areas, even things like cemeteries um, have that sort of large older trees and very much reduced understory that are that would sort of mimic the the natural habitat of, of orchards. But yep, they're still here, um, as are Baltimore's as well. So they both breed here. I personally find both easier to see and hear during migration at least in in our area they they're just they avail themselves visually more at that period of time and yeah and i think it's it's strange to say but i think they sing more frequently early in the breeding season and they're just busier building those nests and things i mean i loved i used to love spring migration for all these birds because they'd start to sing and they'd avail themselves now since we're all spending a little bit more time at home I've been seeing the wave of baby birds come along and I'm just loving it. And mm -hmm. I just want to see some baby orchard orioles. So it'd be so cool. I haven't seen any yet. No, that would be very cute. <laughs> um, here's a really good question from Steve. This falls more in the category of hiding than plain sight, but what's the status of whippoorwills? I never saw them, but used to hear them fairly commonly. Now I don't. And sadly, I would have to say that that is a comment that we have heard over our 10 years in Missouri a lot of times um yeah. folks from all over kind of the central part of the state whippoorwills are in very very steep decline um they're a bird of conservation concern they are even as far as we have heard and seen the data for um are even starting to really really decline in the ozarks as well basically due to habitat loss for those of you who don't know whippoorwills they're called that Thank because you. they say whippoorwill um, on and, on and, on. and they're very closely related to this group of birds called uh, goat suckers because they used to think they would feed off the blood of goats at night or something like that. Um, but the Capromuglidae family in general, um, they are so cool. They're primarily nocturnal. They often sing all night um, and they have this huge gaping mouth. And so they're flying around at night catching all these flying insects. And so it's it's theorized that both the uh, habitat loss and degradation along our riparian zones, as well as um, the loss of our invertebrate, our insect communities, um, uh, has, has caused their declines. But um, it's something to keep an eye, ear out for. Uh, we enjoyed uh, some goat suckers uh, just last week. We heard them booming. They'll dive and shake their feathers and make a booming sound. and and paint sounds and we figure that they're um, net, night hawks that are nesting on their rooftops downtown and coming out here into the country and feeding off mm -hmm. the, the, the grasslands. Mm -hmm. So, uh, which is their night hawks native habitat. That answers the bird that's never seen <laughs> question. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> yes. Awesome. Not seeing any more questions come in, y'all. So we'll go ahead at 6.32. Um, if nobody's got any more questions, we will wish you all a good evening and thank everyone for coming and thank you for sticking in till the end. Yeah, thanks everybody. Hope thank you, you for coming. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Pause.